Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for coming today evening and I'll be speaking on the Ramayana. I'll take specific characters and we'll see what we can learn from them. Today I'll focus on Dashrath and we'll contrast the decision taken by Dashrath with the decisions taken by Dhritarashtra. If we look at our life, it's like a journey. And on a journey, if you are going, say, driving on a long road, so quite often the road is straight. We just move along that road. But at periodic intervals, we come to intersections. And if we take a wrong intersection, a wrong turn, then we can go far away from the destination. So like that in our life, there, are, there is a normal routine which we follow. But during the course of our life, sometimes life brings us to intersections. And if we consider our journey by driving, the destination will be shaped not just by how we drive on the straight road, but also which turn we take at the intersections. And primarily by that. So like that, if we look at our lives, there are certain moments in our life which shape our destiny in substantial ways. Those are the times when we take some fateful decisions. They can be positive, they can be negative. So the scriptures, the, the, the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavatam, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, they all focus on guiding us out how to make decisions. So if we are driving along the road, if we have set the destination, then automatically we are told, okay, turn right, turn right, turn left. Now, now the GPS can guide us, provided there is a destination clearly. Now, if we don't have a destination, then GPS may also become disoriented. Where, where, where do you want to go? So the first basis for us to make any decision in our life is that this has to be a destination. But then, life does not always provide us a clear-cut destination always. Now, so we may decide, okay, I want to grow in my career, I want to expand my family, I want to grow spiritually, I want to do this, I want to do that. These are broad directions we have. So when people take certain decisions, it is not just the moment when the decision is to be taken, or oh, you turn left. You could have turned right. It, the moment of decision is a moment which we prepare for consciously or unconsciously by all that we have done earlier. So our value, so when we are faced with a particular situation in our life, will you do this or will you do this? Now, at one level, such choices come at every moment. But major choices come at certain moments. When we study scripture, it is important for us to approach them properly. So this talk will be a little, the first part will be a little philosophical before I move on to practical applications. When we study ancient books, how do we study them? We might just hear them as stories, or nice stories to learn something from them. But how do we learn something from them? They could just be entertaining stories. Now we have Krishna Leela depicted very attractively in programs like Little Krishna. Or we also have now animated depictions of the Ramayana, Mahabharata. And these are primarily for entertainment. Now, entertainment is also a human need. But the scriptures are meant not, not just for entertainment. They are also meant for enlightenment. So we could say, that we have the body, the mind, and the soul. So, the body needs food for nutrition. The mind needs some entertainment for recreation. It's a need of the mind. We need breaks from our regular life. But beyond that, the soul needs enlightenment. Enlightenment is an ultimate knowledge of values. So, if we approach scripture simply as stories, 
they will purify us because their story is connected with Krishna. But we may be stuck at the level of the mind itself, just seeking some entertainment through it. But if we want to be nourished spiritually, then we need to approach them for the purpose of enlightenment. And enlightenment means, again, enlightenment is not just suddenly we start seeing a light everywhere or suddenly light fills our heart. Now, enlightenment basically means we understand what is the purpose of our life and how to achieve it. That is the essence of enlightenment. That sadhana sadhya sreshta nahaya nishchaya. We all have some sadhya, some goal, and we have some sadhana means. So, what is the goal of life and what is the means to achieve that goal? Knowing these two things is the essence of enlightenment. And then, enlightenment is a journey. It is not that we come to an enlightened state and we stay static over it. The journey goes on, but then the journey takes us closer and closer to our Lord. So, for approaching scripture through the for the purpose of enlightenment, we need to see that scripture describes certain incidents, which are literal incidents. So, I'll talk about a concept called the ladder of abstraction. It, is, it might seem a little complex, but it's a simple concept. <laughs> ladder of abstraction means that at the bo this is like a ladder, at the bottom of it are specific details. At the top of it are universal principles. Have I talked about this last time when I had come? Okay. So, the ladder of abstraction basically means, if I say, today I come and say that, okay, today I will speak on how the population of polar bears in Alaska is going down. What? <laughs> How does it relate to us? If we just get details without any context, it doesn't make any sense for us. Even if the content is meaningful, it will not be meaningful to us unless there is some context to it. So if I say, actually our ecology is in great danger, we will face imminent shortages of vital necessities of life. Now life itself will be threatened. And one indicator of that is how the population of the Alaska bears is going down. And what has happened from there? There is a specific detail. But from that specific detail, I'm going to a universal principle. Principle is that the environment is getting degraded. And then, so we could say that at one end, if this there's a two-way ladder if we have like this. So for, at the other end of the ladder is the, the Polar bears population going down. From there, there's a general principle at the top of the ladder. That is, that, okay, the environment is degrading. And from there, we come down the ladder, okay, how does it matter to me? So basically, similarly, if you study scripture, scripture gives in detail certain incidents that happened thousands of years ago. So that is like at the bottom of the ladder of abstraction. Certain incidents happened, they themselves could be entertained. But from there, we rise up. Okay, what is the universal principle here? And then, we come down, again, the ladder of abstraction to our side. How does it apply in my life? Now, how it applies in our life is something which each one of us has to investigate. That is something which will require introspection, maybe discussion with our friends, well-wishers, guides. But we, if we stay stuck only at the level of details, then we won't learn the universal principles and then we won't be able to apply. So now, uh, with this background, let's look at the first major heart-wrenching incident in the Ramayana. The Ramayana is filled with, with Karunya Rasa. Karunya Rasa means, actually it's a, it's a Rasa of agony, Rasa of distress. If we look in one perspective, Ram's life is filled with distresses. And yet, he responds to all of them in a very principled way. And that is why his character is considered so glorious. So while Ram was going to be coronated as the king, as the prince regent and then the king, whole conspiracy happened. Kaikai was somehow misled by Mantira and Mantira told her that if Kaushalya's son becomes the king, 
you will become her maid servant and your son will become his servant your son may be banished or maybe even killed <coughs> because ram will not tolerate any competition there's no basis to her arguments but somehow she persuaded kaikai and then she told kaikai that you should use the two benedictions you've been given long ago and dashrath came that evening in a mood of celebration at one level he was going to retire so that could you could say that's a some some sadness is there but for him it was a joy that his son was now competent his son was going to become the king and dashrath was delighted at that idea so he came happily to his palace and he came to kaikai first and kaikai was in the morning chambers and she was more she was in such distress and she slowly but surely emotionally pressured and dashrath was aghast when kaikai told that i want two benedictions what were the two benedictions exile exile ram for 14 years. 14 years and make her the king yes now when she said like this it was so shocking he could not believe why would she ask something like this and thereafter the shrug back to her stop it if you want if all bharat to be the king let him be the king but don't send her to the forest i cannot live without him and what fault is he why should he be sent to the forest like this no you have given me your word will you dishonor your word and the question comes up over here that dashrath to honor his word sent his son to the forest and ram also gracefully went to the forest that dashrath tried everything to try to stop him but it plunged him into an ocean of sorrow such sorrow that he actually couldn't bear that and eventually he died and the whole kingdom of ayodhya sank into an ocean of lamentation so this may raise the question if we consider was dashrath maharaj's word of such importance that if one's word causes such great distress that is one still obliged to honor the word so basically going back to our point of making decisions i'll explore this theme further in our future classes but broadly the mahabharat says that there can be three parameters for deciding what to do you can look at the intent the content and the consequence the intent is why am i doing something the content is what am i doing and the consequence is what is the result of what is it so when we have to make a decision say if a doctor recommends that okay this person this leg is badly fractured it is badly injured and is filled with infection now the remaining body may also get infected so we have to amputate the leg now if that now that's a serious thing to amputate the part of a body of someone now when that is to be done say okay what, how is this going to result what is the what is going to happen by this we say from medical point of view that is what is advisable but then for that person can we get a prosthetic limb how important it is uh, how important is the functionality what functionality is possible with the limb so basically we'll have to look at all these three factors and sometimes we can foresee the consequence sometimes we can't foresee the consequence So with this three framework, if we look at the content, what happened to the Shrut Maharaj? He was born as a Kshatriya, and for in every situation in life, wherever there is a power, there has to be a fetter. Fetter means something which restrains the power, restricts the power. If anybody gets unchallenged power, then that can be very dangerous. when say uh, if somebody becomes a dictator then if that person has nobody to challenge them then they can do terrible things and this power corrupts and absolute power 
corrupts absolutely. So Kshatriyas, especially those who are kings, they have enormous power. And for to ensure that they don't abuse their power, they are trained very deeply to honor their word. That they may give when they become the kings, they may give a word of honor to the to the priests who enthrone them as the king that they will serve the citizens. There are traditions where people take vows, this is what I will do, this is what I will not do. Or there may be that when they make a promise, you know, I'll take care of this, then they stick to that. So the word of honor enables people to, even if later on some other situation changes, sometimes some emotion changes, then morality, it is said sometimes, morality is simply lack of opportunity. <laughs> Many people who are moral, they are moral just because they don't have an opportunity to be moral. <laughs> but if they got an opportunity to be immoral, many people would act immoral. So, so, so then, if future situation comes when they can abuse their power, but if they have given a particular word at a particular time, they will stick to that word. And that way, they can be protected from their own lower side. This principle of keeping one's word is very much emphasized in the scriptures. Now let's contrast before we go further in analyzing Dashrath's decision. So Dashrath felt that I have to honor my word. And he had a natural affection for his son. Intense affection. And it was not every parent has affection to their children. But in his case, Dashrath had not got a child for a very, very long time. And he had tried a lot. Eventually, by doing great yagyas, he had finally got not one child, but four children. Still, Ram was the first child, and Ram was expected to become the next king. So, he had special affection for him. At this point, even if you don't consider the point that Ram is God, the Ramayana is such that Ram doesn't always assert himself to be God. He sometimes manifests extraordinary power. But the mood of the Ramayana is that Ram is an ideal human being. So therefore, if you consider, I'll talk about this at three levels, this particular decision. If there is a, there is a family attachment to one's son, one's child, that's naturally there. But then if there's the word of honor, Say if there's a there's a high court judge who has to who has to make a particular decision against a particular person who's been accused, a defendant, and say the defendant happens to be his relative, his child. And now in most situations the judge will be told to recuse from that. But if there is a panel of judges, somebody else can take up the role. But a king is only one. The king can't recuse from that responsibility. So if we consider there is a there's a principle of acting honorably and there's a principle of acting affectionately towards one's family members. So this is a conflict. And Dashrath chose to honor his word. Of course, in this case, Ram had not done anything wrong. So it was not that Ram was a wrongdoer, but it was the principle that he had to honor his word. Now we could say about this, there's another principle that Ram is God. And one of the concluding principles in the Bhagavad Gita is Sarva Dharman Parityajya Mame Kamishar Namraja Give up all varieties of religion and just surrender to me. So when that is stated, what does it mean literally? Krishna says you give up everything for my sake. And there are examples when Arjun does that. Say for example, Arjun when he is fighting the war on the 14th day and he has to shoot Jayadrath. So he has to reach Jayadrath but he is not able to reach. And finally, when he comes very close to Jayadrath, eight warriors come suddenly and block him. And he is despairing. He knows that if he can't reach Jayadrath, he has taken a vow, he will die. Then Krishna arranges for the sun to be covered. And then Krishna tells Arjuna, shoot now. Don't, Arjun lowers his bow and disappointed Krishna says, 
Don't lower your bow. Take the Brahmastra. Place it on your bow and point it towards Arjuna. And at that time, Arjuna doesn't ask any questions. And then, Krishna removes the chakra. And the sun appears again. The last few rays of the sun are there. Arjuna shoots the arrow. At one point, here Arjuna doesn't ask question to Krishna. So if we are doing something for God's, for this purpose of the Lord, we can put aside all other considerations. So couldn't Dashrath have said, no, Ram is God. For his sake, why should, my word is important, but he is more important. So this could be another level. So there are some Sri Vaishnava Acharyas who say that actually Dashrath acted wrongly. Because, you know, why did he have to honor his word more than the word of God, more than his, more than the Lord? But that is, that is out of the affection. Oh, why did Ram have to go to the forest? Why did Ram have to suffer like this? Now, another understanding about this, the fourth level understanding is that, actually, this whole thing was the Leela of the Lord. So it was Ram who had been asked to appear by the Devtas. And the Devtas influenced Kaikai and Mantra. So that Ram would go out of the forest and then eventually challenge the demons and overcome with the demons. So he acted for the service of the Lord. However, this perspective, if we take everything is the Leela of the Lord, then there is hardly anything to learn from it. Whoever does whatever, it is a part of the Leela. Yes, that level is also wonderful, we just relish it at that time. But if you want to learn something, let's look at these three levels. So in the case of Dasharath, he felt, do we need this? Am I audible? Or no? Is it this unpleasant? Doesn't it sound unpleasant? No? Maybe just me it is sounding unpleasant. Okay. Is it okay? Or you can't hear now? Okay. I think this is, is moving in my with my head, mm -hmm. so it's echoing. <laughs> okay, fine. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. So in the case of the Shira, he felt that he has to honor his word. But he had to place, as they say, a stone on his heart to actually send Rama. Now let's contrast this with the Drashtra. The Trashtra, he actually arranged twice for the Pandavas to go to the forest. <laughs> not just once, but twice. The first was, it was not actually sending them to the forest. He was sending, actually you could say not twice, thrice. First was, he sent them to Varnavart. And he told them, oh, there's a nice festival over there, you just go over there. And when he went over there, he had arranged, he knew that Duryodhana was going to do something. <laughs> and Duryodhana didn't tell him what he was going to do. Duryodhana says, they may go and they may never come back. <laughs> 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 so, uh, they say that sometimes uh, some people act ignorant or they stay ignorant. So somebody is telling us some controversial, some secret, you, know, you don't tell me this only. I don't want to get involved in this. So we know something is wrong. So Dhritarashtra said, he knew he was going to do something wrong. He said, I don't know what he's going to do. <laughs> so he did, he did not pay any attention. But he knew he was sending the Pandavas to their death. That was the first time. The second time was, when the Pandavas came back, they won the hand of Draupadi. And when they came back after that, at that time, he gave them half the kingdom. But the half that he gave was, was a forest. This Khanda is complete forest. It's like saying, I suppose after this program we have Prasad. No, suppose Prasad is there. <laughs> <laughs> but, so when we are serving Prasad, say, if there is one item which is cooked very nicely, another item is say, not so cooked cook so nicely. Then, suppose we give one item to one person and the other item which is, which is barely edible to somebody else. <laughs> what is this? This is completely unfair. Multiply this example thousands of times and then we have a kingdom that is flourishing and a kingdom that is completely barren. Forest. 
So now we may sometimes say that actually we should l- uh, that sometimes eco-friendly living means living in the farm or living in the forest. <laughs> but that kind of living is good. But you cannot rule a kingdom like that. <laughs> if you have to rule a kingdom, you need towns, you need cities. So if we consider the ancient culture, in the ancient culture also there were villages and there were cities. We see that Vrindavan is a village, Mathura is a city. So the Pandavas were sent to something which is practically a forest. Second time he sent like that. And third was, of course, when the gambling match was there, and the gambling match, they lost everything. And when the gambling match was ring, and the Pandavas had to go to the forest. Now if you consider Dhrashtra, for him, the Pandavas were not his sons. They were his nephews. But still, because they did not have their own father, so he was like their father. Traditionally, when they were joint families, the the children of one's brothers, one's sisters, they were also treated like a part of one's own family. And if so, the whole joint family, the heads took responsibility for everyone in that family. So the Dhrashtra was expected to take that father figure role for the Pandavas. And the Pandavas always treated Dhritarashtra like a father. But Dhritarashtra was blinded by his attachment to his son. And because of that, he couldn't think of anything for the favorable for the Pandavas. So we all have multiple attachments. And we cannot be, <coughs> we cannot say that I will be detached from this, I will be attached to this. When we live in the world, we do develop different, our attachment goes in different directions. So the, so the important thing is that to have a sense of perspective. Shri Prabhupada explains, the definition of intelligence is to see things in their proper perspective. That means, in this case, okay, I have attachment to this, I have attachment to this also. This is important for me. And that is also important for me. But when a situation of conflict comes, which is more important? So, for Duryodhana, for the Tarash, to be attached to Duryodhana was not natural. He's the father, and Duryodhana is the son. So, it's natural. However, when one thing causes perversion in other things, and that is where the problem comes up. When one, we become so attached to one thing, that for that one thing, we are ready to destroy other things. That's when it becomes very dangerous. For us, each attachment is, it, it helps us to, the word attachment generally has a negative connotation. But we could use the word affection. We use the word attachment to Krishna also. Maya Satta Manahu Partha. Make your mind attached to me, Krishna says. So now, when we are going through life, going back to the earlier metaphor of the journey, we all have to take decisions. Okay, I have come to this road, should I go this way or should I go that way? Now, our decisions are not just our decisions based on the situation or the, or the particular choice that we have. If we say, when it, especially when we are acting in relationships with people, so if I come to a crossroad over here, then okay, if I do this, this person will be pleased. If I do this, this person will be pleased. Okay, then it's not just like an object to choice. Should I go here or should I go there? Based on the kind of attachment we have to a particular person, we will be pulled in that direction. So if this thing will please this person, this thing will please this person. Then, if my attachment to this person is stronger, then I'll be pulled much more forcefully in this direction. And this person is lesser attachment, then I'll be pulled much lesser in this direction. So each of our attachment pulls us in a particular direction. In the case of Dhritarash, in the case of Dashrat, he had a natural affection for his son. But he also had a natural sense of honor. So his sense of affection for his son pulled him. I cannot let my son go to the forest. What fault is he? But a sense of honor pulled him in this direction. Now, in the case of Dhritarashtra, 
he pulled him, his sense of attachment towards Duryodhan pulled him in one direction and his sense of attachment towards his whatever sense of obligation he had he didn't really have much attachment to the Pandavas but whatever sense of affection and obligation that he had he knew they were part of my own family that, that made him consider also okay, he had to take care of it he knew in his heart that he was treating them unfair but this force was pulling him so strongly that in a particular direction that he just got completely lost now let's look at this from the perspective of Ram and the Pandavas. In a sense, Ram was wronged. In the similar sense, the Pandavas were wrong. Ram was wrong for no fault of his, he was sent to a forest. The Pandavas were wrong for no fault of it. They were just they were just attempted to be burned. But is the Dhrashtra situation similar to the Dashrat situation? Not at all. It's what we do is important. But in what context we do it, that is even more important. So if we consider the was the was not bound by any word of honor. He was bound simply by his affection to attachment to Duryodhan. But Dashrat was bound by the word of honor. So unless we look at the content at the context in which something is being said or something is being done, we can often misunderstand. If suddenly someone comes to you and comes to you and says, I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What did I do to deserve forgiveness? <laughs> what wrong did I do? You know, first of all. <laughs> so now, I forgive you. This is a meaningful sentence. But if somebody suddenly comes and says, forgive you, it's meaningless. What do you mean? <laughs> Thank you for forgiving me. We may politely thank you for forgiving me. But what did I do wrong? <laughs> So, without looking at the context, if we make certain statements, that intrinsically they have some meaning. But unless we look at the context, what do they mean over there? So in terms of, in terms of the consequence, I was talking about intent, content and consequence. In terms of the content, both the Pandavas and Ram had to go to the forest. In terms of intent, it was... Dashrath had absolutely no desire that the Pandavas go to the that, that Ram go to the forest. And Dhritarashtra also did not really desire that the Pandavas go to the forest. He says wanted the Pandavas out of the way. <laughs> My son should become the king and you do whatever you want. So the only way to get them out of the way was to send them to the forest. So if we consider in terms of this intent, the Dashrat's intent was to, to, he was bound to some extent by the word which he had given to Kaiki. The Dhritarashtra had no such binding. He had never promised anything to Duryodhan. And even if he had promised, he was not bound like that. So here we see in terms of the consequence. You know, the consequence, when Ram went to the forest, he actually ended up freeing the forest from the influence of many demoniac people. And that was the great positive that he did. When the Pandavas went to the forest, it's interesting, in the Ramayana, there's a kingdom and the Rakshasas live in the forest. Of course, the Rakshasas have their own kingdom also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's, it's also a part of, it's outside the kingdom. But in the Mahabharata, the demoniac forces live in the kingdom only. <laughs> in their own family. <laughs> so, in the, Maha, in the Ramayana, the war happens outside. But in the Mahabharata, the Pandavas come back and the war happens next to their houses, next to their kingdom itself in Kurukshetra. So, in terms of consequence, ultimately, both in the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, the world is freed from Adharma. This world is freed from Adharma. The demons uh, like Ravan are removed from the world. And similarly, the demoniac elements like Duryodhana are removed from the world. But, if you consider, in the case of Dashrat Maharaj, Dashrat Maharaj did not, he couldn't survive just a short time away from Ram and he left his 
world. He left his body, left the world. However, Dhritarashtra lived for a very long time. And he lost all his sons and still he continued to live. And then Ram eventually, the Vidura had to come and urge him to renounce the world at that time. So we see that Dhritarashtra, the word self means Dhritarashtra, one who is very attached, attached to the kingdom. So now Dhritarashtra was so attached to the kingdom that that attachment blinded him to everything else. And it said that Dhritarashtra had to lose everything before he lost his attachments. Hmm. He had to lose everything. He lost his, all his sons, he lost his royal honor. And finally, he gave up his attachment. Now, Ashrat Maharaj, on the other hand, he lost his life remembering Lord Ram. So his departure was extremely auspicious. Dhritarashtra, even when he passed away, even when Vidur came and instructed him, still he could not make sense of things. He couldn't actually devote himself to Krishna. So he was elevated, but he could not be liberated. In the case of Dashrath, he was elevated to the supreme destination because he lived his life in a mode of service to Ram and when he left his life also he left his body he was absorbed in remembrance of Ram and thus their, dis their dispositions and their destinations are extremely different although externally the actions may seem to be similar in terms of the ultimate consequence for Dashrath and for the Trashtra. for Dashrath he was elevated Circumstantially, sometimes we may become bound to do certain things. It's just unavoidable. But if our intent is not to hurt anyone, then eventually that good intention will be reflected. So, if you look in the whole Ramayana, no one blames Dashrath really. Even Kaushalya, she is hurt, grievously hurt. But she doesn't blame Dashrath. Ram never blamed Dashrath. In fact, Ram, when he meets Jatayu, and Jatayu tells him that, oh, you know, I was a close friend of Dashrath. Then Ram says that, oh, Jatayu, by coming in your presence, I feel I have come under the shelter of my father once again. I am blessed to be here with you. So he always holds Dashrath in a very reverential position. In fact, uh, the Lord's, the, 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 the Ramayana is arranged in such a way that after Ram brings down Ravan, then the gods come in the sky to, be, to appreciate the extraordinary feat that Ram has done. But along with that, Dashrath also appears. And Dashrath also blesses him. And Dashrath tells him that you have honored my word now. You have honored my word. In 14 years you have been exiled. Please go back to the kingdom. So, we see that Dashtra, the dilemma that he faced, he did not just honor his word. It was rather he furthered the plan of the Lord through that. So sometimes when we are put in situations where we just don't have an option, we, this is the way I can act. And this is also the way I can act, but this is just not an option open for me, right? Then we can either become resentful, why our options are so restricted, or we can move forward, doing the best in our situation. And eventually, if we maintain a service attitude, if we maintain a mood of trying to do our best for the service of the Lord, then Krishna will bring good even out of the bad. So, sometimes when we are constrained by our situations, we want to do certain things, but it's just not possible for us. At that, Shila, Shila Prabhupada, uh, in 1922, when he met Bhaktisanath Sri Thakur, was so inspired by Bhaktisanath Sri Thakur. He felt, I should dedicate my life to sharing the message of Krishna Bhakti with everyone. But Prabhupada had just got married, he had a child, he said, I cannot neglect my responsibility. His heart was there. I want to, I want to dedicate my life. But he, he continued his responsibilities for almost 40 years. 
throughout it all, he was doing all that he could. Now, if you consider Shri Prabhupada's life, the first 40 years, uh, 43 years practically, since he met Shri Prabhupada, he had very little result. He was constantly constrained by his circumstances. He, he just couldn't find a way. First he was constrained by because he had so many uh, social, familial, financial obligations. Then eventually when he took one pasta also, he was constrained by the socio-political, socio-economic conditions of India. People were just too fascinated with politics at that time, thinking that political change will bring a brighter future for ourselves. And people were too captivated with economic development, so they just had no interest in spiritual. So Prabhupada was also constrained, but he kept doing what he could in his situations. And then, eventually when he came to America, Krishna arranged for Prabhupada to come to America just at the right time. The 1960s were the time of the counterculture where people were exploring alternative ways of living. Many other spiritual teachers had come before and they had created intrigue, interest, fascination about Indian spirituality. Prabhupada was the first person who came and taught her bhakti in a big way. And he captivated the hearts of thousands and thousands of people. So when sometimes circumstances constrain us and they don't allow us to do what our heart wants to do, then at that time we just operate within that situation. We keep moving forwards. And eventually we'll find that Krishna will create a way for us. So we can't always be grateful for all situations, but we can be grateful in all situations. Sometimes the situations are so restrictive that we just feel helpless, we feel frustrated, we can't be grateful for those all situations, but we can be grateful in all situations. Yes. What can we be grateful for? We can be grateful that you know, Krishna is with me that I still have an opportunity to practice bhakti. Even if these limitations are there, let me take one step forward, one step forward. And when we do this, we'll find that Krishna will brighten the way for us in due course. And thus, no matter what life throws our way, we, by having that intent of serving Krishna and being grateful that at least I have knowledge about connecting with Krishna, at least I can do small things to connect with him. I can do this much in this situation. We can move forwards. And eventually, Krishna will reveal his plan by which, even through all the obstacles and reversals, Krishna will bring out good for us. As ultimately it happened for Dashrath, Ram, Ram's glory became established of how he is such a principled son who is ready to give up his claim to the kingdom just to honor his father's word. How he is such a powerful warrior that he could defeat and this overpower the demons in their own head, in their own their capital with a motley army of monkeys. How he was such a heroic son that he honored his father's word for 14 long years. And thus Ram was glorified. And the world was freed from Adharma. And Dashrath Maharaj's word was vindicated. When Dashrath Maharaj faced this whole situation, suddenly Kai Kai speaking like this, he did not know what was going to come in the future. Yes, he, kept, he did what he could in that situation, and by the Lord's arrangement, things worked out wonderfully. So similarly for us, if we stay faithfully trying to serve the Lord in whatever situation we are in, whether they're constrained or unconstrained, we'll find that Krishna will work out good for us. I'll summarize what I spoke, and we can have a few questions. I spoke on this theme today of, is the, I compared the Shat Maharaj and the Dhrashtra and we focus on the theme of decision making. I started by talking about how the epics can be studied for entertainment, if you just see them as stories, but they can be studied as for entertainment, enlightenment, if you see them as a basis for decision making and for that we go we look from the specific details in scripture to the universal principles and then we look at how those principles apply in our lives. So we go from the bottom of the ladder of abstraction, specific details, we rise up to the universal principles. And we come down the ladder of abstraction again to our side, to see how it applies. And then talk about when we have to make decisions, 
our life is shaped not just by how we go through our routines but especially how we act in certain defining moments at, uh, like at intersection when life brings us to and when we have to take decisions at that time it is not just this what we feel at that moment that will make us take decisions or what we think it is all that we have done previously that, sh that shapes our thinking that shapes our attachments and we are pulled by our attachments in particular directions so when we are making a conscious choice to make a decision we can consider our intent the content why we are doing it the content what exactly are we doing is it right or wrong and the consequence what will be the result of this and based on these three factors we can make decisions now dashrath maharaj he discussed four levels at which we can see his action one was that <clears throat> he considered that he he was acting the ultimate level is that it's all the leela of the law other level you could say he had his affection he was at this crossroads one was he had to do right to his son so that affection brought told him that let him stay in the kingdom but then he had his word of honor which by which he had to go tell him to go to the forest but beyond that we consider two more levels he is ram he is god for him everything else can be given up but then in that perspective also ram had a plan that he was going to free the world from demons So the Shri Maharaj's action, in terms of content, he sent Ram to the forest. But his intent was actually not to do something selfish, not to uh, do something for his own attachment, but it was to honor his word. In contrast, when Dhritarashtra sent the Pandavas to the forest, not once but thrice, it was because he was so attached to Dhritarashtra, the reason that he got blinded by that. So based on what kind of attachments we have cultivated, when we come to crossroads, we are forcefully pulled in particular directions. And the Trashtra, what he did was unconscionable, because it was selfishly motivated. The Dashrath was not selfishly motivated at all. And Dashrath departed from the world remembering Ram, and thus he attained the supreme destination. And in contrast, the Trashtra, he stayed attached for a very very long time. Stayed bound and deluded, and eventually, when he was liberated, also even then he couldn't think of Krishna. So all that was elevated, but he didn't get the supreme destination. In terms of the consequence of Ram's actions, of the Shri Krishna in the case of Rama, and Ram was glorified, and the world was freed from Adharma, from the uh, from the demons who were spreading Adharma. Similarly, the Pandavas were sent to forest. The Pandavas' glory came out, and then the world was freed from Adharma. But the dharma was inside the house itself. It was the shrut had nothing to do with the dharma that Ravana was doing, but Duryodhan, the trash had everything to do with the dharma that Duryodhan was doing. So ultimately, if sometimes we are put in constrained situations where we just we just don't have any options, we just forced to act in particular ways, then rather than resenting, we can still be grateful. Even if we can't be grateful for all situations, we can be grateful in all situations. And if we do the best we can in that situation, eventually Krishna will bring out good from it. The so Prabhupada was extremely constrained in his desire to serve Krishna also for almost forty years. But in the last ten years, Prabhupada arranged for Krishna to be in a Krishna arranged for Prabhupada to be in a situation where wonderful results came out. So like that, Krishna can bring out good from whatever difficulties we may face. Because of our situations, because of our circumstances, just stay faithfully serving Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, please. So we talked about the Trisha and uh, how he was so patient. This Dhritarashtra's uh, wife Gandhari was also there, and when when Pandavas were led into the forest, even she didn't say anything. She could have said something, she but she didn't say anything. But it was finally Gandhari's curse that even brought Krishna out of that. Uh, I mean, that was one of the things that was told. Uh, so what I can I can relate to that in terms of okay. Gandhari did not even do her duty. Okay. That's good. But question. then uh, she was the one. He was one of the reasons how Krishna was sent out of the world. Yeah. 
So if Gandhari did not do her duty at all, uh, then in terms of is restraining the Trashtra or restraining Duryodhan, then why did her curse have so much potency that it applied on Krishna and caused the destruction of Krishna's dynasty? First of all, no curse can act on Krishna unless Krishna wants it to act. So Krishna chose that he had to end his Leela and he had to end the reign of the Yadus on the earth. So the Mahabharat describes, actually the Mahabharata is understood at three levels. One is it's, it's an earthly fight between two dynasties. Then it's also a cosmic fight where the Devatas descend to the earth and then the Danavas ascend to the earth. So Duryodhana and the Kauravas, they are actually Danavas who have come there. The Pandavas are Devatas who have, Pandavas and their people on their side are Devatas who have come there. So it's a cosmic battle with the earth as a place where that battle happens to take place. <coughs> Sometimes if you consider say World War II or some world, some big wars, the two armies they are marching towards each other and it's in a small village somewhere which no one has heard about. The two armies confront each other. Then that village becomes famous after that. Mm-hmm. Now, man, if in that village on one side there's a, there's a river in between, one side the one different one army is there, other side another army is there. That whole village may become filled with so many weapons and warriors. But after the war is over then if those weapons and warriors all stay in the village, that's not required. So for that particular time when the Mahabharata war takes place, actually everybody, there are there are powerful forces from the higher levels of the universe as well as the lower levels of the universe. They all come on the earth. And then when the adharma is removed, then those forces have to leave. So those forces are not required over this, they leave. So similarly, Krishna just needs a pretext for the Pandavas, for the for the Yadus to leave the earth. And when it is said that Gandhari's curse was the cause, it was not the Gandhari's curse was the cause, Gandhari's curse was the instrument. It was Krishna's plan that was the ultimate cause of it. Gandhari's curse became simply an instrument for that to happen. It was the uh, Krishna wanted to remove them and Krishna wanted to have the law. It is described that some of the Leelas of Krishna are Asura Mohan Leela. Asura Mohan means they are pastimes which are meant to delude the demoniac. Just like normally when the Lord, we take the Russian of the Lord, we become free from illusion. We have worldly desires, but we behold the beautiful form of the Lord, our worldly desires go down. But when the Lord comes as Mohini Murti and the Asuras see him, what happens? See him or her, whatever you have to refer to. <laughs> then they say, Mohini Murti, they get deluded. Sometimes the Lord comes in a form, or uh, the Lord does something which is actually meant to delude the demons. The Lord's departure from the world, Jiva Goswami explains, is a Asura Mohan Lila. It is a, a pastime meant to delude the demonia. That Lord who who had actually gone to the abode of Yama and come back, abode of death and come back, bringing those who had gone to the abode of death and bringing them back. That Lord, how could he possibly have been killed because of an arrow hitting his foot? Wounds to the foot are not fatal at all, unless they get infected and they get complicated. So, Arjun, when Arjun, Krishna was Arjun's charioteer, Krishna was right in front of Arjun. So many arrows, even Bhishma's arrows hit Krishna. And Bhishma was far more powerful a warrior than any some random hunter somewhere in the forest. And Krishna's forehead was bleeding. That means the arrows hit him on the forehead also. But Krishna did not fall at that time. How could a, a arrow by a, some unknown hunter in the forest hitting his foot affect him? So if we consider from the whole perspective of logic, there is no logical reason why that should happen. But this, this is a pastime arranged by the Lord. So those who want to look at that kind of, look at reality from that perspective, Krishna gives them the opportunity to get from that perspective. So that's with respect to how the Pandavas were destroyed, how the Yadus departed from the world.
Now, as far as Gandhari's curse having potency, it's described that when we do dharma, any kind of dharma, we get some power. So, <clears throat> she did some adharma, or rather she did not actively stop adharma from happening. She was herself aghast. She was not in that assembly, generally uh, gambling. Whenever gambling matches take place, it's, it's like a men's activity. So that's why when Draupadi was called there, everybody in the royal assembly was aghast. How can a woman be called here? Women should not be called over there. So later on she came to know Gandhari that such a terrible thing had happened in the assembly. And she was aghast at what her son had done. And she actually did a lot of, lot of fasting and penances so that her son would be protected. Protected not just from the reactions of the wrongdoing that he had done, but protected from the from the evil intentions that were within him also. He could be purified of that. So she was faithful to her husband, and her that is her chastity you know, to her husband that she covered her own eyes with blindfolds. But she also tried her best to atone for Duryodhana's wrong, grievous wrong deeds, misdeeds. And actually, when Krishna comes as Shanti Dut, and Krishna doesn't, li Duryodhana doesn't listen to Krishna. At that time, Dhritarashtra calls Gandhari. And he tells Gandhari, please, you speak to him. Please speak. And Gandhari speaks to him also. Duryodhana is so insolent at that time, he still doesn't listen to him. And Krishna tells Gandhari later that you yourself, when she curses like that, she says, I ex he says, I accept your curse, but you yourself know that your son was at fault. And that's why, now she had all her power, she had enormous power, and when she finally saw that 99 of her sons had been killed, then she took off her blindfolds, and when she took off her blindfolds, she saw Duryodhana. And when she glanced at Duryodhana, she infused him with such power, that he could not be killed. But Krishna also tells her at that point, you did not bless Duryodhana that you will be victorious. If she had such mystic power, she could have empowered Duryodhana and you know you will you will kill Bhima. But she did not bless him like that. Because she knew what Duryodhana had been done was wrong. But because of her maternal affection, she felt at least he should not die. But of course Duryodhana came with his thigh covered, so that's why he was hit on the thigh and he was killed. So, but the point is, Gandhari, she, she acted circumstantially in a particular way and Krishna used that curse as a means for furthering his own plan. But she, she, how did her curse have that power? That curse was, she herself had a life, led a life of virtue. And she had tried as much as possible to stop Duryodhana from being wrong. But Duryodhana was not, if he was not ready to listen to his father, uh, he was, he had outgrown any tender feelings he might have had for his mother by which he would listen to her. So she couldn't do much about it. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, oh, I have, uh, thank you very much for your wonderful lesson. And other thing that I wanted to ask was, you know, related to how Prabhupada was addressing how Krishna was cursed by Gandhari that he would be the cause of the destruction that she faced with her children. Now also in Dwarka, when Sama, the grandson of Krishna, had that imitation with the womb, I mean, other time we understand that Narad Muni, he is very fair to the demons many times, and especially coming to Krishna's dynasty, he is very affectionate. Now, usually Narad Muni is not like found in that midst of assembly, and is it right that where Samba approached in order to examine the power of the sages that Narad Muni was the, power, the chief person that was there at that assembly of the rishis? Okay. Was it Narad Muni who, when the when Samba was cursed, was it Narad Muni who was one of the agents who cursed him? Or was it the chief among them, sages? Well, he was definitely one among the sages. Parvat was there, many other rishis were also there. When he was cursed, 
within the pictures we see Narad Muni. Yeah, Narad Muni is often seen over there. Now sometimes Narad Muni is seen as a as a person who sows dissension and he causes conflicts. And Narad Muni doesn't cause conflicts. He actually, uh, you could say, becomes the trigger for those who want to fight. So, it's not, he's not the cause, he's the trigger. They say, if a trigger is pressed, a bullet will be shot. But you can't sue the trigger <laughs> if, if a person is killed. Somebody press the trigger. So, Narad Muni, it's the bullet which causes the wound and it is the person who wanted to kill that presses the trigger. So, the trigger is simply uh, uh, the, something which sets the action in motion. So similarly, Narad Muni is the person who sometimes sets things in motion. He is not the cause of it. He is not the bullet and he is not the shooter. He is the trigger. So, in this particular case, now Vallabhacharya in his Bhagavatam commentary explains that Samba is, is always Anartha Suchak. Samba, among the sons of Krishna also, just because somebody is son of Krishna doesn't mean that everything that he does is right. He may also do wrong things. And in fact, if we see before that, is the 10th century of the Bhagavatam, there is the past time of Nruga. Nruga is a king who has been cursed to become a lizard because he offended a Brahman. And then it is Samba who runs and gives the news to Krishna that we have found a lizard over here. Please come and help us rescue it. And Krishna tells the past life story of uh, of that, the, the whole story of the past life of that lizard is told. And at that time Krishna very strongly tells his sons, headed by Samba, that such are the dangerous consequences of offending Brahmanas. Be extremely careful, never offend Brahmanas. So in a sense, that, is a, that incident is a pointer to what is going to happen in the future. Krishna gives a caution, don't do like this. Don't offend Brahmanas. So, it was, again as I said, the whole thing was a plan of the Lord. And it's Asura Mohan Leela. But through it also there is this lesson. That he shouldn't have taken things so trivially. And the sages sometimes have great prophetic powers. But if one starts using those prophetic powers to act, uh, uh, starts to just have fun with, then it is a dangerous thing to do. It is, say, if somebody has a, a WMD, a weapon of mass destruction, and somebody allows a child to go and play with it. The child presses one button, the whole city can blow up. Isn't it? Something like this, with great power, it has to be approached with a sufficient reverence. So, Samba knew about the power of the Brahmanas. He had seen himself the power of of offending Brahmanas, what the result could be, and yet he acted trivially. So in that situation, it was something which was very unfortunate, but Krishna had given a violent warning before. So Naradhuni can't be blamed for that. Naradhuni is the trigger for what happened, it was the recklessness of his sons which caused that to happen. Okay. Can we talk one to one after this? That okay? Any other questions? How do you develop the sense of like in the journey, right, when you reach to that intersection, mm. I know your past activities drive your decision, and that drives your destination when you reach to that intersection. How do you maintain that sense of right and wrong? How do you make sure you, when that yeah. intersection comes, you make the right decision? How can we ensure that when the intersection comes, you make the right decision? Life doesn't come with a guarantee of right decisions. <laughs> sometimes we make the right decisions, sometimes we make, make the decision right. <laughs> that means, sometimes we are able to take a right decision, sometimes we take a wrong decision. But sometimes, it's not that life is absolute, you know, this is a wrong decision means you are doomed. And sometimes it's a wrong decision, but we make the best of the bad bargain. We make the decision right. It's okay, this is a bad decision, but now what, can, what is the best thing I can do? So we have to move forward like that also. It's not that we can keep life on a pause button till we figure out what decision to make. <laughs> life is going to keep moving forwards. Sometimes we have 
the opportunity to deliberate and make a decision. Sometimes the decision has to be taken immediately. We can't even deliberate at that time. So, basically, if if our life overall has a has a good compass to it, compass is what points the overall direction. Hmm? Then, if this is the direction which I want to go, if I come to this intersection, do I take this or this? Sometimes I may take a wrong turn also. But then if our compass is good, okay, I can make course correction from here. So, if we have the opportunity to deliberate and make decisions, then we can as pause, pray, consult with some, some guide, some devotees, senior devotees, friends, <laughs> and write down the pros and cons pray over them again and then maybe keep a certain amount of time frame for making the decision don't rush into the decision that's when we have the opportunity to do all this we can do this so broadly write down pray deliberate consult and make a decision but when we don't have that opportunity we have to take the decision immediately we just take some decision and move on and if it doesn't work out right then we make it work right we make the best out of it it's a it's if we have the compass right for our life then even if we take a particular turn wrong we will realize it is wrong and we will come back on the right but if we don't have a compass itself then it will be very difficult to figure out what is the right decision mm -hmm. those who are committed to nothing can de get distracted by everything mm -hmm. so that's why unless we have a compass we have no reference point for deciding what is the right decision or what is the wrong decision or to make a wrong decision right also. So rather than worrying about how I'll make a right decision when I face a crossroad, we can focus right now on refining our compass. That means if we start practicing bhakti diligently, connect with Krishna when we can, then our heart's attraction to Krishna, connection with Krishna becomes strong and then that becomes our compass. Can we stop here? Thank you very much, Prabhuji. Uh, we have been hearing uh, Ramayana and Mahabharata stories from childhood, but I never ever thought about uh, that we can compare 